Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all very much for attending tonight's Research Tuesdays event, which is entitled Provocation Revoked. My name's Kalia Primer, and I'm a, a PhD candidate within the Adelaide Medical School here in the University of Adelaide, and I'm also going to be your MC for tonight. I would like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, who are the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. Tonight you're going to hear from three people who played a critical role in facilitating a landmark amendment to an outdated defence called the Gay Panic Defence. Up until recently, an, un an unwanted same-sex advance was considered by law to be potentially so confronting as to reasonably provoke a fatal response. This gay panic defence could reduce murder charges to manslaughter, considerably adding to a grieving family's suffering. So in what I expect will be a powerful presentation, you're going to hear how this change to this uh, law came to pass and the impact that this change will have on the LGBTIQ community. Uh, following the presentations, uh, we will uh, begin a Q&A session with our audience here in the Braggs Lecture Theatre, but also our online audience. So thank you to those who submitted a question with your registration. Uh, we're going to try and answer some of these along the way. Uh, but I also encourage all of our viewers online tonight to please submit a question if you have one. Um, you'll be able to do this through the Q&A section that should be about uh, uh, on the bottom of your screen. So now I would like to officially welcome our speakers for tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce all three together at the beginning as their presentations will sort of roll into one another as we go through. So our speakers for tonight are Dr. David Plater, Olivia Jay and Meg Lawson. David is a senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide's Law School and Deputy Director of the South Australian Law Reform Institute. His experience includes working with the South Australian Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions and in legislation and legal policy in the Attorney General's Department. He's also a former senior Crown Prosecutor at the Youth and Inner London Crown Court branch of the Crown Prosecution Service. Olivia was a South Australian Law Reform Institute researcher as a student and continues to assist with the Institute's research on various projects. She's currently an associate to the Honourable Justice Doyle of the Court of Appeal within the Sup Supreme Court of South Australia. Meg is also a University of Adelaide Law graduate and during her studies she contributed to the South Australian Law Reform Institute's uh, research and was a co-author of the Stage 2 report on the operation of provocation and she currently works as a lawyer in civil litigation. So please join me in welcoming our speakers for tonight. Good evening. Thank you for kindly joining us um, for this important research event at the University of Adelaide and also my appreciation to my two erudite colleagues who are kindly with me tonight. This presentation has particularly resonance for where we are today and the timing. On the 10th of May 1972, Dr George Duncan, probably about 100 metres from where we are meeting tonight, was the victim of a homophobic attack. Tragically, Dr. Duncan's killers were never brought to justice. Linked to homophobia is this defence, which many people were surprised was part of the criminal law in South Australia until three months ago, the so-called gay panic defence. Tonight we'll be speaking, my colleagues and I, about the work of the South Australian Law Reform Institute with particular focus on our reference into provocation and also important related issues. Our consultation, particularly with the LGBTIQ community and what resulted from this reference. Also highlighting not just the work of the Institute but also the valuable contribution made by the law reform class. Um, picture of the three of us at the start of this reference. Very briefly, who is the South Australian Law Reform Institute? I'm going to touch on this. These slides will be made available. Feel free to read at your leisure. We are an independent, non-partisan law reform body based at the University of Adelaide. The focus is it's a partnership between the university, the state law society and the state attorney general's department. In, in other jurisdictions, there is a full-time body like the Australian Law Reform Commission. The model we have is suited to smaller jurisdictions. It is based on the model in Alberta and Tasmania. A valuable expert advisory board staffed literally 
I sometimes say the smell of an oily rag. My, my, our erudite director, Professor John Williams, points out we're one of the smallest law reform bodies in the Commonwealth, but certainly, as I'll touch on shortly, we more than punch above our weight in terms of our impact, the quality of our research and consultation, and our output. We are ably supported by specialist researchers looking at both Meg and, Le Meg and Liv. And one of the advantages of the Law Reform Institute being based at the university is we can draw on the expertise of members of staff, students, the community and others. Emphasis, we are not a social justice or human rights body, though our work quite often, as in this reference, has that effect. An emphasis on the work being non-partisan. You will see there a picture with myself, Professor Williams, and the former Attorney General, Mr Rao, and also a picture of myself with Professor Williams, the Honourable uh, Justice Bleeby, and Ms Chapman, the Attorney General at the moment. A focus. We are independent, non-partisan. Um, the role of the class. Um, so, as David's just spoken to, one of the really great things about the South Australian Law Reform Institute is a way that it combines full-time staff with the energy and enthusiasm of students and the dedication and expertise of people who are really at the apex of the profession. The work of law reform students often ends up getting used in the reports of salary and many students like Meg and I go on to formally contribute to the institute after they've finished up with the class. The way that it works is that when the class commences, you have a class of 20 students who each will nominate a topic of interest um, choosing from a range of topics in which research will be of utility to the Institute. The students will then go on to prepare a report and a lot of that work goes into the reports that ultimately get presented to the attorney. So it's a really good opportunity for the students and it is really helpful to the salary as well. Um, and then you have of course the contributions of those whose names will hopefully be more familiar to you than Megan mine such as the Honourable David Bleeby, who was a former Justice of the Supreme Court of South Australia, and the Honourable Geoffrey Mewkey, who was a former Chief Judge of the District Court of South Australia. So what does um, salary do? Well, the word is a reference. That's a topic. Now, it may come from the Attorney General of the day, the government, or indeed it might come from members of the public, interested parties, or one that salary decides to initiate itself. When I say re reference, so we conduct a great deal of research, and this is an area, law reform is not just about the law. It involves looking at public health, psychology, many other disciplines. We consult widely. And echoing the theme made by the Honourable um, Justice Kirby, who was the founding president of the Australian Law Reform Commission, we consult widely, not just with experts, not just with lawyers, not just with the usual suspects. This priority, we'll talk in more detail about shortly, but wide and genuine community consultation is pivotal to our work, the quality of our research, the breadth of views that we hear. And as reference a part of this um, project, where we looked at discrimination law in South Australia and the so-called defence of um, provocation, we also consulted closely with the LGBTIQ community. So we look at law and experiences in other jurisdictions in Australia, Canada, England, other maybe in Europe. Now obviously you have to, you can't necessarily translate unchanged a law from New South Wales or England to South Australia, but certainly those laws are valuable. They tell you what works and what doesn't work. We then make a report. We issue a report with reasoned recommendation for changes to law or practice. I should emphasise that we're not an advocacy body. The implementation of any of our reports or recommendations is a decision for the government and parliament of the day. Saying that though, many of our previous reports have been accepted by both the government and parliament of the day. And one of the things we want to touch upon tonight is we draw on the innovative approach to modern law reform, highlighted by the work of the Honourable Michael Kirby when he was president of the Australian Law Reform Commission. Such themes as law reform is not just for lawyers, the need to reach out to the community, particularly traditional overlooked communities, the need to look beyond the law for solutions to often complex issues. What are our functions and objectives? To modernise the law, eliminate defects in the law, consolidate any laws, 
repeal laws that are obsolete, which I think is a particular act for the so-called homosexual advanced defence, laws which are unnecessary, ensure uniformity where desirable between the laws of South Australia, the Commonwealth and the other states. At the risk of being unduly cynical, the prospect sometimes of getting all eight jurisdictions in Australia to agree, I think there's something in the New Testament that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Perhaps I'm being a little bit cynical, but certainly it's no easy task to get uniformity between the jurisdictions in Australia. And though our work is often used, particularly in the course of this reference into discrimination law, we are not an advocacy or social justice body. Um, I'll touch on it, the history of law reform. Now, South Australia has a very fruitful history of law reform. Justice Zelling, um, when chair of the part-time South Australian Law Reform Committee, 1968 to 1987, produced 106 reports for anyone who's interested in ever reading them. Now, these are valuable reports. It's quite remarkable, given the fact that Justice Zelling had even less resources than we did. He certainly didn't have the advantage of a vibrant law school and a supportive and very engaged class. The focus of Justice Selling was very different in the pre-Kirby era. Focus was on lawyer's law, black letter, technical law. Little focus on consultation. And in those days, I'm showing my age here, we generally looked at English law. We were reluctant to look at law and practice from other disciplines or from other jurisdictions. Now this body was disbanded in 1987, and it was only ten and a half years ago that Professor Williams, with the input of Justice David Bleeby, was able to with, uh, persuade the former Attorney General, Mr Rao, that law reform serves a crucial purpose in any state. And therefore, based on the Alberta model, the South Australian Law Reform Committee was formed, sorry, the Institute was formed based at the law school about ten and a half years ago. As I said, a partnership between the university, the Attorney General's department, and the State Law Society. And I repeat again, Justice Kirby's apt expression, no one owes a law reform agency a free lunch. There is a need for our work to be topical, to be relevant, to be of high quality. Colloquially, salary, that is the Law Reform Institute, punches well above its weight. Small but very productive. Now, Justice Kirby, in fairness, was committed to perhaps the ALRC model. That model will not necessarily suit smaller jurisdictions. Justice Kirby was initially, you will see there, pessimistic about the institute model. Yet it's fair to say with the greatest of respect to Justice Kirby, given his um, innovative and valuable work at the ALRC, one of the things we hope to demonstrate by tonight's presentation is we perhaps demonstrate that Justice Kirby's initial pessimism for the work and output of the Law Reform Institute in South Australia was uh, perhaps wrong. The importance of genuine and inclusive consultation. And this is something which Salary really prides. It's one of the values of law reform agency outside government, independent. The uh, Justice, Justice Marsha Neve of the Victorian Court of Appeal, when a professor. In my view, law reform commissions are often better equipped than government departments to undertake the networking and community capacity building necessary to build public trust and to create a climate for constructive change. Also the work of Sarah Moulds, a very apt illustration for this reference. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I won't go over this conscious of time. These are some of the previous diverse reports that the South Australian Law Reform Institute has produced over the last 10 years in such areas as electronic evidence, privacy, succession law, surrogacy, abortion, which was a particularly sensitive reference, powers of attorney. Many of those reports have been accepted by the government and parliament. So the work of the Institute and directly the work of the law reform class leads directly to tangible and often major changes to law and practice. So the background to this reference arose from the governor's address to the South Australian parliament on 10 February 2015. The first stage of this reference then led to the audit report about discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, gender, gender identity and intersex status in South Australian legislation, which was published in September 2015. 
As part of that audit, this identified there was very strong criticism about the gay panic aspect of the provocation defence. In short, the law allowed an accused in a criminal trial or through a guilty plea to reduce the crime of murder to a lesser crime of manslaughter on the basis that the deceased made an unwanted homosexual advance that caused the accused to feel so provoked that they lose control of their behaviour and kill the other person in response. But this law was only part of a wider and more complex picture and that was then examined in the subsequent stage one and two reports of salary. So this is uh, bringing on what David said before about Dr. Duncan. So the reference of stage one and two was wider than just changing the law and it was linked to two major events. The first event was the 40th anniversary of the landmark decriminalization of homosexuality in the aftermath of Dr. George Duncan's violent death. And secondly, the formal apology by the South Australian Parliament expressed with bipartisan support to the LGBTIQ plus community for past discrimination and injustice. Dr. Duncan arrived in Adelaide in March 1972 to work as a law lecturer at the University of Adelaide. Just over a month later, he was dead. Dr. Duncan, who was a gay, uh, who was a gay man, drowned after being thrown in the River Torrens and at a known gay beat. Ultimately, 14 years after his death, two former members, uh, two former police officers of the Vice Squad were tried and acquitted of his manslaughter. His death helped forge Australia's first gay law reforms. In the 1970s, as some of you may recall, male homosexuality was still illegal in every Australian state and territory. The outcry and outrage over Dr. Duncan's death had resulted in bipartisan support in the SA Parliament to decriminalise homosexuality, being the first in Australia. South Australia's Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act was enacted on 2nd October 1975. It was a landmark for LGBTQIT plus rights in Australia because it fully decriminalised homosexual acts with other states soon following suit. So following decades of campaigning by the LGBTIQT plus community, and their supporters, in 2017, you'll recall that Australians voted in favour of marriage equality via a postal survey, and on 9 December 2017, the Marriage Act was updated to allow for same-sex marriage. All of this was happening in the context of the salary stage one and then over into the stage two reports. While a final year student at the university, I conducted research and co-authored a portion of the stage two report alongside retired Justice David Bleavy, focusing on sentencing and parole regimes in South Australia and other Australian jurisdictions. I'll pass over. Okay. So these were the five, as part of this reference, you'll see from the, um, the reference we received from the state governor, from the state government at the governor's address, was very far reaching to investigate discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender. Part after the audit report that Meg has discussed, I'll skip, I'll skip over this very quickly, you can read for yourself. You see it was far reaching. There are five complex follow-up areas. Sexual reassignment and registration recognition of sex and gender, which has oddly proved highly controversial in Tasmania. The effect of, of exceptions for religious and other schools under the Equal Opportunity Act the civil union or relationship register, particularly in the context of a tragic death of an Englishman who was on vacation on his honeymoon in South Australia with his husband. Recognition of parenting rights, IVF surrogacy. And a particular issue that was raised in our consultation has been touched upon, going back to the days of uh, Dr. Duncan's tragic death, was it the feel, was the sense, was the perception that law reform in relation um, to homosexual issues was incomplete because the offensive and frankly outdated gay panic defence remained part of the law in South Australia. Those are just a reference. Most of the earlier LGBTIQ discrimination work of the Law Reform Institute was accepted with bipartisan support in Parliament and major changes to, to law resulted. 
Now, one of the strong themes, as Meg touched on as part of this um, reference, was the law does not operate in a vacuum. The law operates as part of wider trends in society and changing social values. We undertook wide consultation, particularly with the LGBTIQ community. Going back to Justice Kirby's perceptive theme, law reform is not just for lawyers. And the impact of the salaries work wasn't just in major changes to many pieces of legislation in diverse areas, but was wider. Cultural change, what is described by Justice Neve as deliberative democracy. Now, for those of you who share my slightly nerdy interest in legal history, the defence of provocation maybe once served a valuable purpose. It goes back to the days of capital punishment. It was regarded as the law's compassion to human infirmity. Now, the rationale for this defence, which reduced murder to manslaughter, hence avoided the death penalty, there were four situations. A man, already the focus on men, male honour, to free a person who was unlawfully deprived of their liberty in response to a grossly indecent assault in defence of another, or when a man has committed adultery with someone else's wife. It was about the concept of the male honour. And this is a picture from the 1800s which shows the very gendered lens by which not just the defence of provocation, but other defences was viewed. Now, understandably, not just from the LGBTIQ community, but almost from everybody who we spoke to as part of our reference, the so-called gay panic defence, and indeed the whole defence of provocation, was seen as outdated, discriminatory, a product of a bygone era. Yet, to the surprise of many, in fact, most of us probably in this room, provocation and the gay panic aspect of it were only formally discarded in law in South Australia following our two major reports in February of this year. Um, so turning now in a little bit more detail to the defence of provocation, at its core, the defence of provocation really is a nod to human infirmity or human fragility. And as David's told you, traditionally the formulation of the defence and the situations in which it was raised were reflective of the protection of male honour. Um, the legal effect of successfully raising a defence of provocation is that it reduces the charge of murder to manslaughter. That's really significant for a few reasons. One, from a fair labelling perspective, but not least because of the implications it has for sentence, in that a sentencing judge is afforded far less latitude when fixing a non-parole period in the context of murder than manslaughter. The elements of the defence, as Meg has touched on, are broadly provoking circumstances, a loss of self-control, and a hurdle that the situation would have caused the ordinary person to lose self-control as well. Now, if we're to focus on the gay panic aspect of the defence, what really worried commentators was the scope for men to raise provocation after they had killed another man who had subjected them to a non-violent sexual advance. And this, as David and Meg have spoken to, was a central focus of salaries in the production of our two major reports. The issue really here is that a fatal reaction to a homosexual advance is out of kilter with the values of modern society. The criminal law should not justify or condone violence that is essentially a response to sexual orientation. Um, for interest, a theme that was picked up by both the Attorney General in the parliamentary debates, but also by Justice Kirby some decades earlier in the case of Green against the Queen, is that there's no way we would see this kind of defence be successfully raised by women who have been subjected to an unwanted heterosexual advance. The attorney commented that if it did, there would be a lot of dead men around, that's for sure. The attorney also recognised the problematic operation of provocation in the context of family violence. Essentially, the issue here is that the history of the doctrine demonstrated that it was really not apt for use in slower fuse killings, such as for women who had eventually snapped and killed intimate partners who had subjected them to abuse over many years. While the law should never condone killing, I'm sure there are some who agree that it is easier to sympathise with a woman who kills in circumstances like these than it is with a man who kills in response to a homosexual advance. So that gives you an overview of some of the issues with provocation. When we came to consider the defence in our reports, we were clear that the gay panic aspect of the pastoral defence needed to go. 
but other problems like the gender bias inherent in the defence and the implications for victims of family violence demonstrated that the solution couldn't be to simply excise gay panic and have the operation of the defence otherwise continue unfettered. It was our view that the abolition of the defence was necessary, accompanied by changes addressing the sentencing and family violence implications, as well as related defences such as duress and self-defence. Now, our stage two report was published in April 2018, and the slide here shows some extracts from the attorney in Parliament, including her recording her appreciation of both salary and the contributing students for their work on the report. I'll pass over now briefly to David, who will tell you about the ultimate outcomes from the report from a legislative perspective. So this Landmark Act was really important, and as, um, both, and as Liv has said, it's not just about gay panic. Yes, gay panic's offensive, but gay panic was part of a far wider problem. The defence of provocation was complex, outdated, gender bias unworkable. So this Landmark Act passed Parliament with strong all-party support. It got rid of the whole vexed defence of provocation, not just the so-called homosexual advance defence. It also, and importantly, makes linked changes to the defences of self-defence, necessity and duress to better reflect the particular situation of victims of family violence, which is quite often overlooked in the equation, allowing the use of expert evidence to try and tackle some of the myths and misconceptions so juries and courts are familiar with the true dynamics and nuances of the effects of family violence. And Meg's outstanding work, also the issue of sentencing, how to provide a measure of flexibility to recognise genuine deserving cases where the mandatory usual sentence for murder may be inappropriate. Um, so for interest and also for broader context, I would like to make some brief remarks about the gendered nature of other criminal defences as they stood before the implementation of the Act and their problematic implications for victims of domestic violence. While we could talk for a long time about the gendered operation of self-defence, which is mentioned on this slide, I'd like to focus mainly on something a little bit more niche, being the defence of duress in the context of routine crimes. Duress is a con uh, concept that you're all probably familiar with. If you commit a crime under duress, at a conceptual level, you've been coerced or forced into doing it against your will or better judgment. The elements of the common law defence of duress are on the slide deck, but basically to raise a defence, an accused needs to show that they were under an imminent threat of death or grievous bodily harm in circumstances where a person of ordinary firmness would have yielded in the same way and was thereby uh, induced to commit the crime charged. Now, what I found throughout the course of my research, particularly drawing from multidisciplinary sources such as um, studies conducted in American prisons and also from stories in the modern media, is that there are actually a lot of women who are forced by their abusive partners to commit routine or lower level crimes like theft, fraud and drug offences, even sexual offences too. However, what we found is that such women are unable to raise duress because the elements simply aren't compatible with the reality of domestic violence. So for example, in situations of domestic violence, we know that the threat is not always of death or grievous bodily harm. It might be more nuanced than that. Verbal abuse, lower level but consistent physical abuse, financial abuse or sexual abuse are, have all come to be known as being different forms of family violence. Equally, Threats in the domestic violence context might not be explicit and they might not be imminent, but a woman may nevertheless apprehend a threat by reason of the history of the relationship. Issues like this cause salary to consider whether there was a need to expand the criminal defences to better accommodate for victims of domestic violence. However, there were policy considerations that had to be considered in the expansion of such defences, the most prominent being the fear of opening the floodgates. The fear is essentially one of making the defences too accessible, such that people are able to have their charges reduced or dismissed by raising a defence in circumstances that we may not actually, as a society, approve of. You'll see on the slide some commentary, particularly from judges uh, in the British jurisdiction. For example, Lord Bingham cautioned in the case of Hassan of the peculiar difficulty for the prosecution in disproving a defence of duress whereas Lord Simon dramatically cautioned in Lynch against inscribing a charter for terrorists, gang leaders and kidnappers. 
So with that background, we turn now to the new, defense, uh, new duress provision that has been implemented in South Australia following Salary's report. It follows the approach that is already in place in Victoria and Western Australia of implementing the model criminal code provisions. You'll see that the elements are slightly less prescriptive, um, requiring that a threat, and that's any kind of threat, will be carried out unless an offence is committed, that there is no reasonable way the threat can be rendered ineffective, and that the conduct is a reasonable response to the threat. Salary ultimately recommended this model in our report on the basis that we were of the view that it achieves greater access for victims of domestic violence whilst not throwing the floodgates wide open. We would welcome your thoughts, uh, particularly in the question time that we'll have later on whether you think this model achieves the balance. So turning now to homicide sentencing, there's an obvious interaction with the partial defence of provocation and sentencing. So as mandatory sentencing in South Australia is very strict, if provocation were to be repealed, we needed to consider whether or not the law needed to change to allow for that flexibility in sentencing, especially in these mitigating circumstances that have been mentioned, such as intimate family violence. And this was a key aspect of the stage two report. It was crucial that when we consider the discriminatory aspect of provocation, that the consequential issue of, first of all, the fixed head sentence, as well as the non-parole period be addressed. So as you can see on the screen, there's a summary of the comparison of senting leg sentencing legislation in Australia at that time. So in South Australia, sentencing judges had no discretion in determining the head sentence for murder. They had very limited discretion in fixing a non-parole period that was below that 20-year statutory mandatory minimum. Despite all jurisdictions using the term life imprisonment to describe a sentence for murder, the length of time, of a, li the length of time a life sentence constitutes varies across jurisdictions and does not necessarily describe a fixed whole of life sentence that it's usually associated with. This is why parole regimes also had to be considered in the stage two report. So on a theoretical level, mandatory penalties are underscored by that assumption that all offences that fall within a particular category are equally serious. And as a consequence, all offences within that category should attract the same penalty. However, it's apparent that the circumstances of homicide vary significantly in both nature and severity. So for instance, murder on one end of the spectrum can encompass a single mercy killing motivated only by compassion. On the other, an extremely violent, cruel, premeditated killing of multiple people motivated by power, greed or rage. There's no doubt that there's a large spectrum of crimes and moral culpability of offenders. General sentencing principles require that the penalty must be proportionate to the seriousness of the offence and any mitigating or aggravating factors must be taken into account. However, the restrictive nature of mandatory sentencing of life imprisonment in South Australia means that it was difficult for sentencing judges to properly reflect the differing circumstances of the offence and in turn the differing levels of culpability of an offender. Could our sentencing laws account for that enormous range of blameworthiness and circumstances in homicide with only mandatory minimum sentencing? This question is even more important when you are considering removing access to a partial defence to murder. Again, the partial defence of provocation operated to bring murder down to manslaughter and therefore a person could avoid those tough mandatory minimum sentences. It was also important to consider parole regimes as part of this stage two reference as it goes hand in hand with sentencing. The relevant parole board of a state or territory naturally hears applications for parole from the offender once they have applied after serving that non-parole period. In that sense, parole boards actually end up determining the real custodial duration of most life sentences. 
So one aspect of this research was considering all sentencing remarks for offenders convicted of murder or manslaughter over the past decade in South Australia. We needed to understand who the proposed changes to the law were going to affect and what their circumstances were, as well as just how many people were likely to be impacted. So I considered the length of the sentence handed down or the sentence agreed to via a plea deal and the circumstance of the offence and the offender themselves. When we then used these case studies as a basis for considering whether the current regime could fairly account for situations of genuine extraordinary instances of provocation, domestic violence situations, mental illness, cognitive impairment or intellectual disabilities that fell short of the insanity or mental impairment defence at the sentencing stage. What we found was that provocation has been used successfully to reduce murder to manslaughter in five cases in that time. So other cases that were looked at were where the defendant might have had access to that partial defense of provocation, but for, for either reason it was not successfully run or it wasn't raised at trial, and that occurred in six cases. We also looked at cases where the sentencing judge had made remarks about an offender's cognitive ability and diminished capacity in some form, which may have been a factor in the offending. So mandatory sentencing has been identified as a disproportionate and blunt instrument. If a partial defence to murder was removed from the law, was there a need to increase flexibility when it came to imposing sentences? Would there be a need to avoid the potential injustice of subjecting the offender to such harsh mandatory minimum sentences where there were those exceptional or extraordinary mitigating circumstances in play? For that reason, our research was targeted at whether or not the law was able to fairly respond to killings where an offender's culpability was reduced. This was likely to occur in two main mitigating circumstances. Firstly, where an, offender uh, where an offender's culpability was reduced by the conduct of the deceased. So to be clear, this is obviously not in the sense of an unwanted homosexual advance, but in usually in circumstances where the offender was subjected to that prolonged family violence, who in those really exceptional cases kill and are unable to make out other defenses like self-defense or excessive self-defense, or even, as Liv has mentioned, duress and necessity. The concern was that the abolition of provocation would then lead to higher sentences for those individuals than would otherwise have been imposed if the law wasn't changed, and the sentence would therefore not be proportionate to the seriousness of the offence and the circumstances. The other potential category here is those exceptional and extreme provocative circumstances. Again, this is not meant to refer to instances where there's been a non-violent sexual advance, i.e. gay panic, or jealous, possessive, abusive partners who've killed their spouse upon revelations of sexual infidelity, separation, or disobedience. It's rather looking at genuine cases where uh, where provocation serves a role in legitimately reducing an offender's culpability. So one key example of this is the English case of DPP and Camplin. Uh, in Camplin, the accused was a 15-year-old boy who killed a man by hitting him over the head with a pan. Provocation was raised as a defence as it was alleged that the killing occurred under a loss of control as the deceased had raped him and then laughed at him, at which point he lost his control and hit him with a pen. Ultimately, the House of Lords substituted the original conviction of murder for manslaughter on the basis of provocation. So the second category we were concerned about primarily was where the culpability was reduced by reason of offenders having impaired mental, cognitive or intellectual function who fall short of making out the mental impairment defence, obviously known more commonly as the insanity defence. It was concluded that if, partial, if the partial defence of provocation was to be abolished, then there must be an amendment to the sentencing regime for murder. That was to give greater recognition to those two potentially mitigating factors and to make sure the sentence was proportionate to the seriousness of the homicide committed.
even if the discriminatory aspects of the provocation defence were repealed, if that was without any adjustment to sentencing, it would frankly have achieved very little. In fact, it would replace one form of discrimination with another and would have the effect of substantially increasing sentences and non-parole periods for convicted persons who would otherwise have been able to avail themselves of the partial defence. One of Sowery's recommendations was if the present mandatory minimum sentencing regime remained, courts should be able to exercise a discretion to set lower non-parole periods in really exceptional circumstances. This would enhance sentencing flexibility while also recognising the seriousness of murder. Basically, it would be a carve-out exception to avoid an unjust sentence for a deserving accused. In line with Sowie's recommendation, Section 48 of the Sentencing Act has now been amended. The court can depart from a mandatory minimum in exceptional circumstances, including where the offence is committed in circumstances of extreme family violence. Now, I'm going to speak very briefly at the end about some of the themes of this reference, but a really important part of Salary's work is the law reform class and the frankly amazing contributions that are made by students and former students. Um, well, you can see that these are the testimonials of Meg and I speaking to our experiences, and in a sense it does feel quite awkward reading that out when <laughs> you can read them. Um, but. I think I can speak for both Meg and myself in saying that it has been a really amazing and unique opportunity for us in the sense that as a young person who doesn't have any practical experience in the field nor a PhD like David, it's not every day that you get um, to really get into the nitty gritty of an academic project with people who really know what they're talking about and in a way that really matters and makes a difference. And for both Meg and I, really, we as students got to see our work go into something really important and contribute to something that ultimately made a difference. And I think for both of us, that's something that we're very humbled by and very appreciative of. Just to build on what Liv said, um, I obviously completely agree. And I think that when you're a student, sometimes it can feel difficult to know that you're making a change. Um, law can change lives and to have that opportunity to be part of that and apply the skills that you have. You don't need to be a lawyer, you don't need to be a barrister or a judge to make those changes. It really does come from the community level and to have that opportunity whilst you're at uni is, is really incredible um, to apply yourself to something that, that actually will make a positive change in, in people in the community's lives. And you can read the remainder of the lecture slides, but the, vein, the theme is law reform is not just for lawyers. The fact that Salary was able, as part of this reference, to consult widely, particularly with the LGBTIQ community, to research widely, and to come up with reasoned, powerful recommendations for law reform that had a major effect in ending, literally, decades of discrimination, an offensive outdated defence, not just so-called gay panic, the whole problematic defence of provocation, along with the important link changes, as we've heard, to sentencing and self-defence. And I highlight again the importance of genuine consultation. Law reform is not just for lawyers. The point made by Justice Marsha Neve. Public participation in the law reform process is a form of civil conversation which can reinforce community trust in the rule of law and in legal institutions. Consultation processes can contribute to social justice by giving people in marginalised groups in the community an opportunity to be treated with dignity and have their concerns taken seriously. And I emphasise again at the risk of repetition, the theme from Justice Kirby with the 2019 law reform class, law reform is not just for lawyers. The importance of moving away from an elitist approach to law reform, as Meg and Liv have powerfully said. And I'll let you be your own judges. Have we proved Justice Kirby wrong about salary just this once? Well, I think on this particular reference, we certainly can. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. It was a fantastic and incredibly engaging discussion. I've learned a lot. Um, we now have some time for the Q&A, so if you'd like to take your seats. Um, at the front there, we have, well, I have a couple of questions to start us off with. Um, 
My first one is sort of a, a bit more of a historical question. Um, you've clearly demonstrated the value of a law reform institute in not only um, assessing the law and placing it in a more contemporary context, but also making it more accessible to people without law degrees who, uh, I know I couldn't just go and read it and understand what's going on, so clearly it's incredibly important. Um, what was the rationale back in the 1980s for the disbanding of the law reform group at that point? Um, can you comment on that at all? Let's just say that law reform has its ups and downs and I think there was a perception in the 1980s that perhaps some law reform agencies, certainly not in South Australia but maybe overseas, had strayed from the law reform role into a social justice role. I think, however, it's tribute to the work of Justice Bleeby, Professor Williams and John Rowell, the former attorney, that they realised the important gap and the valuable role played by law reform, whether you call it a commission, an institute. As we've heard, an independent body outside government. Quite often community is more willing to engage, particularly on sensitive references, if it's outside government than inside government. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Um, I also have another question um, specifically to do with uh, the actual process you go through with these studies. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what does it look like practically to go out into these communities and speak to people, you know, you're ho holding round tables, um, that sort of thing. What does that research process actually look like? It really depends on the particular reference. It's what the particular... Now, it could involve something that's speaking to a judge, speaking to the director of the Law Society. It might involve speaking to leaders or members of community groups. It's very much a focus on what that particular sector, that organisation, that individual feels comfortable with. So it might be in the format... Traditionally, law reform agencies would produce very long written discussion papers and would invite paper submissions. Those days have gone. I think we need to be, as um, most modern law reform agencies have realised, far more flexible. Liv, I know you've read some of those old-fashioned discussion papers. They don't work anymore, do they? They don't. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we have one pre-submitted question. I think you might have touched on it a little bit during the presentation. Um, but the question is, how often was the outdated law used as a defence in South Australia or in Australia? I know you mentioned there were five cases within South Australia. Um, but can you elaborate on that a little bit more, give us a little bit more context, um, and maybe speak more about the, the broader impact of, of how those, those particular cases were affected? So, as I mentioned, there was, it was used successfully in five cases, but it could have been raised in an additional six, so really 11 in total, which when you uh, view it as a statistic, you might say, oh, 11 cases over a decade, what's the significance of that? But if you are the accused, or if you are a family member of the, the accused, or, a vic or even a victim, or someone associated with the victim, that is incredibly important and powerful. And it can change the difference between a 20-year sentence for a victim of extreme domestic violence to something that is more fitting to the crime that they perpetrated, uh, aside from a life sentence. I think it does also need to be recalled as well that if you're talking about provocation, you're exclusively looking at the offence of murder. And it does need to be recalled that we are operating in South Australia in what is a relatively small jurisdiction. We do have murders here, but they're not going through the courts constantly. You don't have hundreds of them a year or anything like that. And so when you keep that context in mind, 11 over a decade, one a year, that's actually quite a lot. And certainly the research into state from our colleague, um, Dr. Kate Fitzgibbon, who kindly joined our stage one report, provocation is raised quite often. It's also, it's a source of great confusion because judges are never quite sure, do I leave provocation to the jury or not? The High Court has said, even if the defence lawyer does want provocation, you've still got to leave it to the jury. So it's an additional complicated or complication in an already complicated trial. The homosexual advance defence, it's not an ideal expression, whatever you call it. Um, it, that was raised perhaps once in South Australia, it was raised occasionally interstate and overseas. And believe it or not, occasionally, juries were prepared to accept the so-called homosexual advance defence. 
even as late as perhaps 2013, 2014. So as Liv said and Meg touched on, the perhaps limited numbers in South Australia where provocation was raised, or certainly the so-called homosexual advance defence were raised, belies the far wider problems, both in South Australia and particularly interstate, with such a problematic and quite often offensive so-called defence. Absolutely. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have one down the front. This has a microphone. I'll take this opportunity to remind any of our online viewers, if you do have a question, you can add it in the chat box um, on Zoom. Um, we've definitely got a little bit extra time to go through some, some questions online as well. Yeah, good day. Um, if the murdered person didn't die, um, was there such a defence for serious assault and has there been any reforms? Perhaps surprisingly, as um, Liv touched on, the defence of provocation, partial defence, was only available to the crime of murder. For every other crime, it has always been a possible mitigating factor, along with many other factors. I think the historical reason why it was reserved for murder was because in the 1800s, murder obviously carried the mandatory death penalty, the so-called concession to human compassion. That's why, it just in modern era, it just makes no sense because, as um, Liv touched on particularly, question of sentencing. Provocation is a possible mitigating factor for murder as for any other crime. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Another down the front. How about the future? What is your approach to badly needed non-existing laws such as euthanasia? I really don't think it's appropriate. I just don't know. It's not a current reference of salary. Um, my dear wife is a nurse. I have certain personal views, but I, don't think, I really don't think so. I don't think those views are really effort for my views tonight are completely incidental, really. Liv, Meg, I don't know if you've got any views at all on that subject. Um, I think what David means to say is that if we were to speak to um, social and legal issues like euthanasia right now, all we would be doing would be talking about our own personal views. And because we are giving a presentation as a law reform institute, um, there's limited utility in sharing how we personally feel about it. Absolutely. Any other questions? We've got another one on the, on the left side. Uh, I definitely think you've proved Justice Kirby wrong, but I just wonder whether um, an argument for a weakness in the, in the Institute is it's supposed to take references from the community as well, and yet it seems to me that all the references do come from the government, and whether um, an area for possible growth is to be more encouraging of getting references from community bodies and individuals? That's a very, f very fair question. Obviously, we have limited resources. We have to pick our references. In fairness, though, this reference came from the government. The reference that we looked at, the issue of abortion, came from the government. We're currently looking at the role of intermediaries in and out of court to help vulnerable parties give their best quality evidence. They didn't actually come from the government. That came from ourselves, from the, from the community. Quite often what we find when we're as part of a reference, we're looking at X and question Y comes up. So certainly, Kelly, I take on board that. I think it's fair to say, yes, we have regard carefully to what comes from the government, but also we're open to potential significant references if they come from other sources. Thank you. Any further questions from the audience? I don't think we do have any, and we've got none online. Um, so I would like to wrap that up, and we'll finish now by thanking our speakers for tonight, David, Olivia, and Meg. Um, you've delivered a very thought-provoking discussion. I've learnt a lot, so thank you all very much. And please join me in thanking our speakers. And thank you to you, our audience, um, for viewing and for your questions and comments throughout the presentation. We're extremely excited to be delivering these, pres these presentations uh, on campus and to you viewing at home as well.
Uh, we look forward to inviting you back in June when we're going to hear from Dr. Russell Brewer from uh, the Criminology Department at the University of Adelaide. He will discuss the continually increasing abundance of child sexual abuse material being distributed online and the work that he is doing to help identify persecutors. And I'm sure we can all agree that that's incredibly important work and will absolutely help protect our most vulnerable. So be sure to sign up for our mailing list if you're interested in hearing about that uh, and also to receive the latest information about any other Research Tuesdays related news. Thank you all very much for tuning in once again um, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.